Welcome to today's Your Author program. My name is Patty Valdovinos, librarian in the Multilingual Collections Department. And I'm here today with my colleague, Celia Avila de Santiago, senior librarian at the Junupero Serra branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. It is our pleasure to host the Your Author series today. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout the program. Also, don't forget to email ecdept at lapl.org coming down on the screen right there, and it'll be in the chat box. Uh, so email them to be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a copy of today's book, Loteria, by Carla Arenas Valenti. In today's Your Author program, writer Carla Arenas Valenti presents her upcoming book, Loteria. Carla is the creator of the series, My Super Science Heroes, where she works in partnership with the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Having lived in Germany, France, Japan, and Mexico, her work reflects her cosmopolitan lifestyle and Mexican heritage. Carla resides in Chicago with her family, including two lazy kittens. We want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund and the Library Foundation for helping the library bring these amazing year author programs and illustrator programs to all of you at home. Um, so thank you both so much. Uh, and now for the moment that we have all been waiting for me personally all week long, just dying for this moment. Um, welcome, Carla. Yay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hosting me. And before we start, I have to tell you both that I recently saw your interview with uh, Michelle Reese um, Kyle. It was amazing. I loved it. So entertaining. And you two are by far my favorite librarians on the entire West Coast. Definitely <laughs> the favorite librarians I've talked to today. So thank you. Yay. You thank heard that she said West Coast, though, not the whole country. We're waiting for the whole country there, Carla. We have some pretty good <laughs> librarians around here. So you're right. You're right. We'll take it. We'll take what we can get. Yeah, we'll take it. I'm already just going to put that. I know. <laughs> great thank you all right thank you so much carla for taking the time to be here with us today it's wonderful to have you here so we can get to know about more about you what your creative process is like and your work with loteria so before we get started do you mind sharing your favorite passage with us so i'm going to start by reading the first pages of the book because that's actually how the book started it started with a line um so if you'll bear with me i'll take you down the the first chapter of loteria in which life and death arrive and a girl's destiny hangs in the balance. Life sauntered into town on a wave of heat. He looked quite dapper in his black suit and matching vest with a crisp white shirt and the tiniest hint of red peeking out of his jacket pocket, a crimson handkerchief monogrammed. His tall, short-brimmed hat provided little shade from the blinding white sky and his walking stick left cracks on the dry and brittle land. The high-pitched whine of cicadas pestered him incessantly. Life raised his walking stick. With a tap, the stick opened into an umbrella that shaded him and his companion, a skeletal figure in a bright pink dress, delicately embroidered with flowers and birds. A crown of roses rested on her skull, a few petals trailed behind her. Plucked by a curious draft of hot air. Shall we? Life asked. We shall his companion replied, brushing dust off her sleeve. She may have been Lady Death, though she preferred to go by the name Katrina, but that didn't mean she was immune to the allure of beauty. That was great. Um, I could keep going. Yes, I know, <laughs> oh, I'm I totally just going. <laughs> we have the whole hour, that's fine. Right, I'm just really so you read the whole time, it'd be the best. <laughs> uh, for me, reading that i was just like you know as you're introducing katina i was like oh my god but is it gonna be is it gonna be and that was, <laughs> i was so excited um but it's interesting to hear that you know 
I love when the authors tell us about what it is that sparked the book, their ideas for the book and that first line that comes to you. So we're always kind of curious about that process and you know how you get that first line that comes to you and then how you build this whole world and these people around it. You know, and somehow you get us to be super invested. Like Patty and I were texting each other all day long, basically like, oh my God, are you at this part yet? <laughs> so what is that like in the writing process? And then once you have all those ideas down and you've got this amazing book, uh, what's that publishing process like? How to, you know, get it essentially into a cute little book like this for us? So I think that's a really great question. Um, because it reflects at least my in my personal journey, which is not uncommon for writers, that it's a really long, long process. Um, the idea for Loteria actually started as a question. And, and the question, I have a background in philosophy. I'm always thinking about these big questions. And so this big question that I had been thinking was basically about free will. How much choice do we have in shaping our identity and in, in who we are? Um, and so I was trying to figure out a good way to, to put that into a story. For 10 years, I had been workshopping these different stories in my mind. I wrote, and I kid you not, I wrote maybe five 40,000 word novels that I discarded because it just wasn't the right story. And I would just keep tossing out ideas and plots and outlines. And, and it's just this long, long process. Um, the, the concept I had settled on was this, this story about a girl um, who's trapped in a game. She doesn't know it. She thinks that she has total control over her life and the choices that she's making. The reader doesn't even know it. And then at some point she realizes she's in a game. What would that do to you? What would that make you question? All of a sudden you think everything you did had been controlled by somebody else or, or was it? So that was the premise. And I kept thinking about how to, how to execute it. Um, and then at some point, I was living in Germany at the time, and at some point my father came to visit and he brought a Loteria set for my kids. And so there we were, it was displayed out on the table. And I had this moment of, oh, right? Where you're, you don't even wanna take it further than that. You just wanna hold on to that possibility that maybe this could be the game. Um, I was missing Mexico terribly, so I was also trying to find ways to, to connect with my home country. We'd been there for almost six years at that point, and I really had not been back to Mexico. And then, coincidentally, my brother chose to get married in Oaxaca City. So we all flew down to Oaxaca, um, and we just walked through this incredibly enchanting land that combines it, which just marries the, the prehistoric and the pre-colonial with this modern and these colors and the sounds and the music and the food and the whole thing just came together. And when I went back to Germany, I sat down and the story wrote itself. And I'd I mean, it's funny because it came together in probably four weeks, but it was the process after 10 years of trying to put this together. And so once I had all of these pieces, you know, combined and I thought, okay, this is the story. This is how I'm going to do it. Um, I wanted to really explore the question at the heart of the book. Do we have free will? So I chose my two characters, life and death, and they were going to debate this issue. And um, I researched extensively both the arguments for free will and determinism. Um, I didn't really have to decide who would do what. They naturally fell into this role that just made sense. But of course, the novel can't just be the two of them debating, right? And so then that's where Clara's story comes in. And, um, and the two stories went pretty parallel um, and they, they interweave. And I love the idea of Clara being this pawn in the game. Um, and the questions of free will and determinism actually playing out in her life so that readers can see you're not just hearing the arguments, you're actually witnessing how it happened. And, and the question is always there. Was it her choice or was it predestined? Was it driven by something else until the end where there's a twist? And, um, and we'll talk about that later, but that, that's sort of how the story came about. It surprised me as much as anybody because I just, I'd been working on it for so long. And then when it came together, it was like, oh, there it is. Yeah, awesome. it was, it was, uh, it put a different take on playing Loteria, growing up playing Loteria. I was like, oh my God, imagine if this is real. I right. mean, there were moments where, I mean, cause it is the game of chance, right? Like, exactly. and so this whole idea, I mean, talk, you've put a philosophical point on Loteria and now I just feel like I can't. 
display it the same. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I will never look question. at it the same. Exactly, exactly. Or anything, right? Everything you do, it's like, is this me or or is there some other, you know, element and, and work here trying to, to move the pieces? Mm -hmm. Right. And how everything is. Yeah, this, this book was just definitely written beautifully for all ages about how life, just life and thinking about it and all that good jazz. It was it was very mind opening in a really good way. Yeah. So um, the art throughout the novel is beautiful, as you showed us a picture of. Um, the cover is beautiful. We were all, like me and Celia, were just in love with it. Um, how involved were you in the process? And did you get to pick which scenes you wanted to have illustrated? I'm very fortunate because I don't think it's typical for the author to have very much involvement with the illustrations. But in this case, because the book was so visual and it's really so dependent on the artwork, um, part of my, my contract, and fortunately the editors agreed, was to allow me to have some measure of input in the illustrations. And so as the, the, um, the, the process evolved and they were selecting illustrators, they would send me the, the list of illustrators and say, which one do you think is, is in line with what you're thinking? And, and so I was able to provide input and I could not be more delighted with the illustrator that they chose. Dana Sanmar is, is just brilliant. She is such a genius and particularly with her papel picado, like her cut paper art um, that she does, it's magical. And, it, and it's a perfect thing to bring into the story of Loteria with the papel picado. Um, and so she did all of these illustrations. They they did ask, my editor did ask if there were certain scenes that I thought would, would be suited for illustration. And I think that was very helpful because there are parts in the story, especially the kingdom of Las Posas, mm -hmm. uh, which by the way, is based on a real place that exists. And if people Google Las Posas, you'll see it. And it's amazing. It's a mind boggling surrealist park that exists in the tropical jungle. It's unbelievable. But you need to be able to visualize that because it's just so abstract. And so that was definitely one of the scenes that I that I thought should be illustrated. And I think Dana and the, and the art directors agreed. Um, so I was very lucky to be able to have as much input as I did. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's great. And like, sorry. Um, I, I think the cover needs a lot of like emphasis. I wish I could zoom in, but I can't wait till people get their hands on it because just the way the Loteria cards pop out is mm -hmm. really what attracted me to the whole. Yes, and just, just the inclusion of the Loteria cards throughout the book was something that um, helped me keep track of what, what might happen. Right. Next. So that was, I just, yeah. Right, and the tablas, to have the tablas in the book. Yes, of course, yes. Dana created the individual ones, right? And individual yes. cards for all of that. That, yeah, I just, I wish I could like zoom in, but yes. So. <laughs> and the cards are really, they're really cool because, you know, they're not like the traditional Loteria right. that, that we see. It has like its own little embellishments and elements. Uh, so, you know, it, it's just beautiful all around. Like, like Patty said, I can't wait for everyone to see it and get their hands on it. So Well, and so much went into the, the just thinking through the execution mm -hmm. of the cover right? Because there's a lot of symbolism in the cover too. The color scheme, the, the way she has all of this wind blowing behind her. There were many versions of this cover that we, that we talked about and each one created a different, um, a different emotional response in us, mm -hmm. right? And so it was really interesting to be a part of that process and to really see all the thought that Dana put into it. You know, the silver strands in Clara's hair and yeah. which cards got featured. And, and, you know, you'll notice that there's a spider on the cover and that's an important character in the story. And, you know, at one point there were other characters and, and, and each one of those details was so carefully thought through it, it really impressed me and it showed that Dana was was exploring this idea of free will as well in her artwork right and that's what makes um, that's what I think is a good marriage of, of text and, and artwork yeah it's, yeah it's a good summary to the story like yes. I, I went back to the cover once I was done with the book and I really looked into it and I was like the whole cover just tells the story exactly so, exactly yeah like the spider I hadn't noticed until <laughs> after after I read after I read the book I went back and I was like oh my goodness there's that and that and right and, and it's in the corner you can barely <laughs> see it but it's scary enough it's right yeah. there ready to crawl out yeah <laughs> yeah it's just so good um, so how how do you create those visual narratives and the characters in your work and and are they a reflection of your surroundings and experiences maybe people you know 
So the, the, the places themselves were primarily based on real places, um, especially Oaxaca City. We had just been there and it was just so vivid in my mind. It was very easy to, to pull that into the story. Uh, some of the other places like the Gruta de Oro is based on the Grutas de Cacahuamilpa, which are in uh, very close to where I, my family's from in Cuernavaca. And we've been there a million times and it's such a, such a, um, such a remarkable cavern system. And, and every time you go, it's just very awe-inspiring. And so it was very easy for me to draw from that experience. The Kingdom of Las Posas is a real place. I've not been there, but there's, there's plenty of, of images on Google. And so that was a good resource for me. And I do that a lot uh, with the stories. If I'm trying to find the right visual, uh, I'll, I'll just Google different images and then just describe them. Try to try to paint the the that that image with the words. The characters, none of them are based on anybody in particular, but their underlying values and and their their principles, I guess, are are based on on my family, right? And so. Mm -hmm trust and and the importance of family and um wanting to you know, like when they go on their picnic on sunday with the family i i grew up doing that every sunday we would get together with my extended family all 30 of us <laughs> and we'd go and have this huge picnic and we'd play in the rivers and we'd climb trees and so i i put my memories in in these children and in these characters uh, even though none of them is really anybody anybody in particular that's great to see. I think um, it's interesting to hear you say that you didn't choose anyone in your life to have a reflection of these characters, but experiences. So I think that's the first right. time I've ever heard an author say that. And um, usually I hear people be like, oh, it's my family and this and that. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's it. that's a really cool intake of including in your writing. Which I think makes it a little easier to mm -hmm. write them because I realized with some of my characters, I'm so invested mm -hmm. or connected I don't want to sacrifice that family member or, <laughs> right? I don't want to take them somewhere I don't want to go. Oftentimes I've written drafts of stories that, that are my kids or that are my brother. And then I don't want the character to do stuff that will hurt them. But we can't do that, right? That's the whole point of storytelling is really showing how these char characters can be heroes. Um, but if your characters, if you're not going to let them get hurt, <laughs> they're never going to rise to the level of heroics. Yeah. And so in this case, um, it was very helpful to dissociate the characters from anybody I knew. Um, and then, you know, you can have your bad guy, you can have your king, right, that steals yeah. the, the souls of children and you can have the devil. And, you know, that's fine. They're nobody in my family. So <laughs> yeah. it's okay. Imagine, oh, God, they'd be like, death reminds you. Oh, God. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I yeah. mean, it's the glow, glow, growth of Clara, right? I think you are right. You wouldn't that you wouldn't want to, and also with such a intense topic, I'd be so scared of like jinxing something. I'd be like, exactly. I never. Oh so, my yes. god, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't want to be like, oh my god, did I just have premonition through yes. my book? Yeah. So, I can't yeah. tell you how many times I'll be like, I'll write this whole scene and then delete, 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 right? Maybe yeah. that shouldn't happen. So there you go. Now, now I feel like I'm going to have a different way of writing. <laughs> yeah. I've got, you know how many times I've gotten um, like advice about like, if you can't write, then have, just imagine that a character is a friend or a family, but now I'm just scared. Right. Great. Thanks, yeah. Carla. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh man. All right. So on that note, do you hide any secrets in your books that only a few people will find? Well, in this book, I hid all of the Loteria cards. And uh, there, there's a process and the madness to, to how Loteria came to play. And I think we'll talk mm -hmm. about it a little later. But for now, and for all the people that might be watching, every single Loteria card shows up in the book at some point. Uh, so after you've read it, you can go back and see if you can find all of those cards. Uh, and then the other is that the the land, Arrean, the, the magical land where uh, Clara and Esteban end up going is actually, don't tell anyone, but it's the anagram of my name, Arenas, and I did that for my family. Oh my so God. I don't know <laughs> if they are going to figure that out. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. yeah, I didn't figure it out until you just told me now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I, I, did, I, 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 go ahead, Celia. I did notice that all the cards came up because I started, um, I had a list next to me. As I as they were coming up, I started oh. checking them off because I had looked up Los Dichos 
or something that I had forgotten about them. But I was like, oh my god, these are so funny. And so I looked <laughs> them all up, and I had a I had a checklist next to me as I was reading, and I would cross them all up. So it's interesting you bring up the the dichos, right? The mm -hmm. riddles, because that that actually posed a challenge in writing the book mm -hmm. because I would want to feature a specific card, but then the traditional riddle that was associated with it was either wholly inappropriate or just made no sense <laughs> yeah. at all or wasn't even that interesting. And so I'd, I'd have to scratch it and then replot the whole thing to bring in a different card that I could use a different riddle with. So it, they did add a little element of complexity. Oh, yeah, I, that's what I was wondering because the first time they came up, I was like, oh, I wonder if all of them will be here. But I feel like <laughs> you brought them all in in such a beautiful way and they tied into the story seamlessly. You know, so even like the card, I, I really appreciated the way that they were brought into that. I don't want to like spoil it for anybody, but um, it was really cool to see them come up, you know, a game that you've been playing like your whole life. To see it kind of come to life through these characters was really just beautiful. It was amazing for me. And I, I think the Dichos, right? Because I think growing mm -hmm. up, the Dichos was something I heard when I was a like kid, kid. Yeah. And then growing older, I think that tradition has left. So hearing them i was like oh my god that's right we did grow up hearing the dichos with it um but also something i wanted to bring up with the dichos is how tricky was it to translate them because sometimes you know as someone who does yeah. translate stuff sometimes spanish does not translate very well in english and you're right. just like this is not gonna make sense which is like i mean sana sana colita de rana right it's <laughs> one of the things where i'm like i have no idea how to say that in english <laughs> <laughs> it's so absurd. That is so absurd. How do you even, how do you even begin? You can't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but that, that is a perfect example, right? There were some mm -hmm. where you would translate it and, and it's, it just, it, it's nonsense. And so, you know, we couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> use that one. Yeah. So it actually, even though we have 54 cards to work yeah. with, mm -hmm. it, it was a much smaller subset <laughs> that I could actually put to play in the, in the story. That makes sense. Uh, so is there someone you think about or a specific target audience or person when you're writing certain characters? There isn't. And I think that's been a bit of a challenge for me in the past because I tend to write my stories. I write picture books as well. And I, I do this with my picture books as well, where I have this idea and I just want to write about it. And it's this, this concept, this philosophical idea or this ideological idea or this principle or theme. And then I just get so caught up in the weeds and the, the debate about it and the beauty of the concept. And, you know, like if it's a four year old, that might be a little bit heady to try to, to try to navigate. And so that has been a challenge for me to, to try to find ways, not of, of getting rid of the complexity of the idea, because I think children are quite capable of exploring all of these concepts, whether they're four or 40. It's more, how do you, how do you speak it, right? How the words you use, how can you concisely say this in a way that presents the, the, the issue and opens it up for people to think about without getting so lost in the concepts? And actually, this was a challenge I had with Loteria, because one of my first drafts was so heavy on the debate. I found it fascinating. And so I was plugging in all of this interesting stuff that I was discovering about free will and determinism. And and my editor, you know, at some point she's like, it's 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 too much. You have to cut out some of this. And you really, you know, we're losing the story to to all of this. And so that was a that was a huge challenge for me. I just I ah I get so caught up in in the in the the idea that I lose sight of who I'm writing for. And so I have to constantly be reminding myself that the audience has to be comfortable reading this, this book. And that means it can't just be a philosophical treatise about some <laughs> random thing that I thought was interesting. I mean, that adult novel, I'm just saying, if you're ever interested, you should write an adult version of this. I think that would be my yes. <laughs> but it's so fun to write for kids. It's so yes. it's just and to write with kids, right? To yeah. just this this age. I didn't realize how much I would love it until I went on these journeys with these middle grade characters, right? This age is so rich with transformation and growth and they're so curious and they don't care about all this other stuff. They'll go wherever, they'll go into the kingdom of Las Cosas. They'll, they'll follow the devil. They'll do this, they'll do that. Magic is real, right? Like how fun yeah. to write that. It's, it's amazing. 
I mean, yes. Mi to me, middle schools, I love that age. At the same time, I'm so intimidated by them because of their <laughs> bravery. Yes. You're, you're right. Like it's, it's the age where you're just forming yourself and mm -hmm. I mean, they're great. I love that age, I think. But I'm also like, don't make me cry, please. Because you <laughs> they have that power. They're that one age group where I'm like, all right, that's- Well, but you said it, right? The bravery. And and, yes. and somebody had asked me this once, uh, what was my favorite Loteria card? And, and immediately, I, the one that came to mind was El Valiente, right? The brave one, which is actually the card that I chose for Clara. But mm -hmm. I think that sums up middle graders because yeah. they're in this period where they are growing out of their skin. They are realizing that the world is huge and complicated and sometimes scary and chaotic, and they have very little control over most of what happens to them. They're super vulnerable, and yet they just jump right in. Like, what, what else can we say but bravery, right? Yeah. It, that is That sums it up. And for us, it's super intimidating because we know what they're getting into. But for them, bring it on. Right? Yeah. Yes. Amazing. I mean, yeah, if I can have an ounce of bravery that I think middle schools in that age group have, I think my adulthood would just be so much so different. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And it, I, I think it's it's true. Reflecting on that, it's something we definitely grow out of, right? Because you know, you're like life and you know, adulthood. Yeah. And I I just wish that that life that like age group right is is would get more emphasis right because i think sometimes as adults we just overlook them because of that intimidation part but it, they are such a youthful and you learn so much from them so absolutely yeah well and was it at all intimidating you know is it at all intimidating writing for this this age group and you know how do you balance any of those hesitancies that you have in your writing for I'm lucky that I have a middle grader at oh. the moment. So I, I have a middle grader who became a young adult and I have an elementary one who will become a middle grader soon. Oh. But my daughter, who's the middle grader, is actually a, a fantastic storyteller. She's very analytical. She reads voraciously and she is my number one critic. So <gasps> it, it's good and bad, right? I, the, the first draft <laughs> of Loteria that I wrote, the, the one that I was like, okay, this is, this is a real proper draft. Mm -hmm. I had her read it and that was so scary. It was so intimidating, right? <laughs> because she's the target audience, but she also yeah. knows what I'm trying to do and can point out all the places where I failed, right? All the loopholes and all the incomplete ideas and concepts and, and, and plot holes. And so, yeah, that, that was very intimidating. Um, but going through her and getting all that out of the way, then I felt like, ah, the rest is a piece of cake. No yeah. other editor can throw <laughs> anything at me that's worse than that. Right? I mean, talk about critics, hard critics, right? right? Exactly. Oh, what was man. It? What was the hardest thing to hear from her that she I know, disliked about one. the book? <laughs> So I think if with anything. this one, I was, I was like, it was okay. She, she pointed out a few things that didn't work. It's with the subsequent ones where I'm finding oh. it really hard <laughs> and I'll share my ideas. And then she'll be like, hmm, that that face, oh, that face what did I miss? Yes, exactly. And she's right. She's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, she'll say, oh, you're just, you're, you're going too far. You're getting lost in this or <laughs> You need to resolve this thing and, and you hate hearing it because it means, you know, I got to go back to the drawing board. But on the other hand, she's spot on. She's spot on. Yes. And I wish more of us would do that. Right. Seek mm -hmm. our youth for critique and feedback. I think this is a huge learning point for any adult to like hear your words and be like, I think it's time for us to go back and hear that criticism. Yeah. Um, we are writing for them, right? And who better yet to tell you where you're hitting the nail or you're not. And so mm -hmm. I think that's a great reminder for us to just move forward in writing. I'm happy to share my daughter with anybody no. who would like an honest critique. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know if I'm ready for that. I know. I'm just like, oh, man. Well, I mean, she thing. reads everything, everything, and she reads yeah. profoundly. And when she gets frustrated about a book, she wants to rewrite it. And she says, this is, these are the plot points where this person failed. And this is what I wish they had done. So she's not kidding. She really knows what she's doing. And that's, that's why I take it seriously, because she really, she's got her head in the game and she knows exactly what needs to happen. Man, I want to know a lot more stuff about your daughter, but we'll move to the next. Because I just want to be like, is she going to be a writer? Because I'm so into you know, all these things. Um, all right, we'll go to the next question, though. So we've played Loteria multiple times. I think this is the question where um, you were talking about. So we've played Loteria multiple times, and we noticed that our, there are more cards in the stack than, than, than what were mentioned in the book, which 
is wrong because we all of them. Are <laughs> so what made you choose those specific cards for the book storyline? I guess the ones that were ref that we automatically saw from like straight. So as I was writing the book, I had the, the Loteria board spread on my table and all the cards and certain cards just stood out, right? Of course, death, the devil, like these big heavy cards that have a story in and of themselves. But then there were others where you would just look at it and, oh, I don't know, the ladder, like, ooh, I don't know about the <laughs> ladder, right? Or the, the basket or the gallo, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I ended up doing is I would write the story and then I would get to a point where I didn't know what was gonna happen next. And so I would flip a Loteria card and whatever came up was my next plot point. And that actually turned out to be a really helpful writing device to keep yeah. the story going because it forced me as well, it forced me to keep writing and to, to sort of use the creative muscles. But it also was exactly what was happening in the story. So it felt very authentic, right? Because it was as if life and death were flipping the cards and the story was unfolding in Clara's life. So it was almost as if I took on the hat of life and death in that position, right? And, and I myself didn't know where this story was headed. And in fact, I didn't. I had in my mind a vague idea of how this was gonna end and how life and death's debate was going to intersect with Clara's story. And I kept flipping these cards. And then I flipped La Corona. And I was like, the king, there's gotta be a king in here. <laughs> And what, what does he do? So he wasn't even there until almost the end of my first draft. And then as soon as he came up, I thought, oh my God, he is gonna be this king that's sucking the blood from the kids and immortal and it changed <laughs> everything. So then I had to go back and rewrite a lot of these things to fit yeah. him in. But he didn't show up until almost the end of the story. And then the other thing that, that surprised me because I used this process of just writing as the cards were flipped is that when I got to the story climax, and I won't give anything away because I want people to read it. <laughs> yes. But what happened is I was convinced I knew how this story would end. And it didn't. It Clara made a choice that that blew my mind that I was not expecting. And, and so the story ended up going in a completely different direction. I had zero control. There is no such thing as determinism when you're the <laughs> author. It was complete free will as the story unfolded. And it just, it shocked me to, to be a part of that process. But it was also so fun. And it was like this meta experience for what was actually playing out in the story itself. So I felt a little bit like Clara myself, you know, and, and just playing all of these different parts. It was fascinating. I mean, just hearing you talk, I mean, so to me, it's like your whole book is like a game of chance at this exactly. point. Exactly, yes. Yeah. 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 Every time that they are flipping those cards, I'm just like, oh my God, is it on their tabla? Like, is it <laughs> I mean, I think at a certain point you empathize with Clara, right? Like, yeah. cause it's heartbreaking to see her be living this game, right? She has no control over, right? And yeah. so as a reader, you're just like, you're just sad. Exactly, you're like, but, and so you're having this complex, issue right with life and death and then clara and like she's so young and so i mean it was so it, it just hearing you how you wrote this book is really amazing because it is like a, a a game of chance and uh hey i'm thing. like yeah right but here's the thing so clara is is this pawn right with yeah. life and death and the cards are being flipped but I also made sure that she made a choice at every yeah. step of the way. And sometimes it was a small choice, like the color of the ribbons that she put in her hair, yeah. but that choice actually had consequences. And so in every one of these scenes, my, my goal was to actually have the reader wonder, was it life and death or was it actually Clara? And if you yeah. go through and you look at every one of these moments, you'll realize that it could have been either. And that was part of the goal, right? Is that it is inconclusive. My goal as an author is not to tell you the answer. It's to pose the question so that you have to think through where do, where do you fall on that spectrum? And so I never wanted to actually give the reader a definitive answer one way or the other, or even what, you know, is it free will or, or, or determinism? Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. So Clara did make choices every one of those steps.
Yes, and you you definitely see her growth in it. Her confidence mm-hmm. in those uh, they just, the choices she made just became bigger and bigger. Right, and she saw the reflection of them on her life in a more impactful way. Right, yeah, I mean and she's yeah. so different by the end of the book. Yes. So yeah. it's really I don't want to spoil. I anything, know it's so hard to talk <laughs> about it without like yeah. just digging in. I mean, you, people got to get their hands on this book mm-hmm. and. Um, well, I, I think you, you mentioned sort of how she is at the end of the book, and yeah. that was that was tricky to write for for obvious reasons that you guys know, yes. but it was also <laughs> tricky because um, people didn't want that ending to unfold yeah. the way it unfolded, mm-hmm. and so I really had to fight for it. I really had to defend that mm-hmm. position, um, and I'm happy I did because I think in the end that was the right story. Yeah. And um, and I think it shows exactly the value of the choices that we make. Yeah, I think it is such a young age. I, and I, you bring a good point out because I think as adults, kids are making hard choices. Exactly. Or youth, teens, exactly. tweens are making hard choices. And mm-hmm. this book, because even at some point, right, as an almost 30 year old, I was like, wow, that's a hard choice. But then I took a step, like I, I stopped myself and I was like, but children and teens are making hard choices such exactly. as this on an everyday right. basis. Right. Do you, yes. So, um, I, I, mean, I want I, the kids to see themselves in these books, yes, right? right? It's not just uh, from a diverse standpoint, mm-hmm. but yeah. it's also from this authentic, yeah, I can recognize these, these difficult mm-hmm. choices that you're making. I know how that feels and not shying away from really exploring that, um, you know, even bringing the concept of death into the story. And I know that was something that, that you wanted to talk about, but mm-hmm. talking about death and, and in, in Mexico, you know, death, of course, nobody wants to die and, and you know, <laughs> death is serious business, but it's also a party, right? It's also yes. Dia de los Muertos. It's also Katrina. It's also, so I wanted to really push these these concepts and push kids to feel comfortable navigating these ideas um, in a in a safe space, right? But but yeah, these are ideas that they're dealing with every day, and so why not give them an opportunity to run with it um, mm-hmm. rather than shy away from some of these more difficult topics? Yeah, it's important it, it, to see yourself and see the things that you're experiencing in those books. You know, exactly like Patty said, as adults, we forget that kids are, you know, they also have these difficult choices that they have. Yes. To make it's heavy on them. So having books like this, I feel is really important because it does show them the actions of their consequences. And, you know, not everything is nice. Yeah, it's not everything yeah, nice right. and tied up in a little neat bow. Right. And, and Yeah, um, sometimes you end difficult. up in like a creepy, drippy castle with a giant right. spider and you're, yeah. you're wondering, how did I get here? You know? Exactly, <laughs> ma'am. Yes. That giant spider. <laughs> Seriously, I just thought I was like, oh my god, I'm like picturing Harry Potter, which is not. I just picture that ginormous. That's yep. exactly. I don't know. I'm like Ron in this situation. I don't think we're No, it's not. you did a good job. You did a good job. You got us being yeah. like, oh. <laughs> All right. So, uh, for you ahead. yourself, so do you um, do you believe that people have a choice in everything, or that some that everything is predestined for one person? So I'll be honest with you, when I started the book, I was positive there was free will. Of course we have free will. I'm just gonna write this book because it'll be fun (laughs) for kids to read and explore. And then I would research these arguments and I, you know, I'd be like, huh, never thought of that. Huh, maybe we don't have free will. And so then I'd go into this crisis, right? Like in my life, I'd be walking around, oh, there's no free will, (laughs) nothing matters. And then I would sit down and I would research again and come up with this, oh no, phew, there is free will, right? And but but the whole process of writing this novel was was answering that question. And Mm -hmm. if I'm honest, I don't have an answer. And and that's okay, right? Um, I think in the end. The answer that Clara gave, which I guess emphasizes hope, is the only answer that's satisfying to that question, right? Because we don't know. This is a question that has been debated for centuries (laughs) and will continue to be debated for eternity. And in the end, as long as we have hope, that's probably the best path to take, right? And so that's, that's sort of where I've landed. What about you? Oh man. I, <laughs> same. I so as I'm reading the book and they're debating it, I'm just like, yeah, that is that's a legitimate <laughs> point that he has right there. And then I she would argue it and counter and I was like, Yeah, no, she's right. She's right. She's right. right. Yeah. So I also am just going back and forth now. But 
I thought you did so well at arguing both sides. So I, I definitely could not tell where you stood in the book. Yes. And so how was it, you know, on those days where you felt like it skewed more toward <laughs> one, was it difficult to, to write from the other perspective? And how did you, how did you do it? <laughs> you did a really good job. I mean, thank you. Thank yeah, you. It was, it was really well balanced and just the arguments that they would make just, I don't know. It was a perfect balance. How did you do it? Well, I think what was hard was was arguing against myself because I knew where I stood at the beginning. I knew my <laughs> whole theory of it. So what was really hard was was like honestly putting down an argument to to defeat my own ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And so in those, I mean, how do we always feel when we do that? When we have to accept <laughs> the truth that someone tells us that goes, you know, counter to what we believe? Yeah, it's hard. But but I think. That was a, a, a good experience for me, um, you know, to to write with integrity, to write with honesty. If this really was to be an exploration of this big question, then I had to do it honestly. And, and that was really important for me. And so, yeah, of course, there were moments where I really I was really confounded. And wow, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. That was that was the tricky part is that there were times where the arguments were so compelling that it would take me days to find the counter argument. And I would sit there, no, but this is this is what she's going to say. This is what he's going to say. And how do I get myself out of this, this definitive answer, right? Because I never wanted to provide an answer. I wanted to just provide another question. Uh, so that was the hardest part of it. it. wasn't so much researching the arguments, but making sure that there was always a counter position balanced. that was equally balanced. Exactly, exactly. And you... It you float, you like tied it in well, because it wasn't always, you know, there wasn't always a, always a solution or an end to the argument at the end of the chapter. So, you know, even the characters would take their time to, to come back with their rebuttal. So I could see, you know, he would just sit there and think on what think about it, it was yeah. she just argued. And then a couple chapters later, he'd be like, well, you know what, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd Wait, come back with yeah. it and he, and then she would sit there and kind of let it sink and, and so, you know, we really see your process in that. And so I, I thought that was a beautiful way of showcasing that. And it really kind of mimics how real life arguments should be. Exactly, about. exactly. And that, I, I hadn't even thought of that, but again, to bring it back to the value for middle grade readers, to see that, right? To see mm -hmm. that we can actually have conversations about these very big concepts where we don't have an answer mm -hmm. and we have very compelling arguments and it's okay to take our time. It's okay to think through them. It's okay to come back and say, well, what about this? But it's also okay for someone to challenge us mm -hmm. and, and to admit that, hey, that's a really good point. Let me give it some thought. So that, that that's, I think the process itself of debating is really important. And, and to be able to showcase that in, in this way, um, I guess is an added benefit to the, to the story. Yeah. yeah, I think debating between really close friends is also yes. was very attractive to me because I think, right, when we're friends with someone, we never want that disagreement to happen, right? We're friends for a reason, but I think mm -hmm. these are healthy conversations to have when you don't agree with your really close friend, right? I mean, they're talking about like life and death years. Right. Um, but uh, I also wanted to add that you bring in love, right? The actions of love and also with hope. And so love and hope to me was where i was at within that right because i think hope and love can skew you in different yeah. choices right so um that was interesting to see that was i like gasped a little i was like <laughs> look at carla bringing in love of course you would bring in love <laughs> well and that that one was interesting because i was thinking about you know the love i have for my kids right for my family and how it's unconditional, like that's a no holds barred. That is a hundred percent. I am a slave to that love, right? Yes. There is zero free will in that love, yeah. right? But then on the other hand, really, right? To be able to love someone freely, that's yeah. that's the ideal, yeah. right? And so love has those two sides as well. But, and, it, and it's a complex thing that's worth mm -hmm. exploring. Yeah. And, um, I mean, just that whole, the whole moment was just so, especially with family and friends, I think that concept, right? Because I think sometimes we get so attached to this idea of love being so skewed one way, but so the way you put it really made us dissect this idea of love and like free will and the, you know, de de determination and all that. So that, that was, that was the moment for me in the novel that really hit the, 
Hit the nail. All right. So um, what are some of the challenges you faced in tackling such a topic for a younger audience? How did your daughter feel about it? I know. How did well, she yeah. loved it. Yeah, she loved it. But she and I will also go into these. She is my sparring partner when it comes to these <laughs> philosophical <laughs> concepts. So I think for her, that's that was great. very appealing. And mm -hmm. that's actually one of the things that sold me on being able to really pitch this book and, and sell it, right, is that it, it showed promise on both the, the heart and the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the challenge, though, the real challenge for me once I started writing was pulling myself out of the weeds and making sure that I that I was able to, to just whittle down the, the argument that I wanted to make and just say that, right? And then add some nice setting and some nice dialogue, but just not to get so carried away with mm -hmm. the cha-cha-cha-cha-cha, which, <laughs> which can get a little bit tedious. <laughs> Wow. I mean, I think these, it was, it's a very philosophical question and mm -hmm. I think it's great that your daughter and you and just this book, I mean, I just want to talk about it to everyone. So I can only imagine, I want to hear what youth have to say once this book comes out from their input. And so, uh, so do I. So please reach out anybody and tell me what you yes. think about the book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, I definitely, I mean, if I had tweens around me, I'll, I have just too many little ones at the moment, but I, I, wait can't wait to have, give them this book so yeah i'm i can't wait to like for the first kid to come out to me at the right. library that i can hand it to them and just be like this one this one read this one it's great it's amazing <laughs> um so for me and patty one of our favorite lines in the book was uh things always get interesting when the devil makes an appearance so it seems like the devil was one of the main characters of the book and this line uh kind of hit into his role into the development of the storyline so why did you pick the devil and um, his character kind of makes us reflect on the difference between how American culture and Latinx culture view him. So the differences, and Patty and I had talked about this a little bit too. So we were kind of fascinated by your choices and, and using him as you did. So very similarly to this concept of death, which you're, you're right, right? The way the Latinx history views death can be a little different than how it's viewed in other cultures. And I wanted to emphasize that. I, I, I really wanted, for instance, to show Katrina both as this skeleton, right, which is the, the, the trope of death, but also this beautiful, wise entity to, to have that tension, right, which is the same kind of tension that, maybe not tension, that's not the right word, but this, this, this two sides, right, because nothing is really ever black or white. It's 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 multifaceted, and so I wanted people to be able to see the multifaceted aspect of death. Mm -hmm. Same with the devil. Um, the devil made an appearance. Um, it was one of these cards, and he had a story, but it wasn't the typical story that that we hear of with the devil. Mm -hmm. And so, like the corona, I had to think about well, what what is the devil's story and why why the devil and how can he play a different role than what he traditionally plays um and so then when he made an appearance katrina's thought was actually my thought i was like huh things are about to get interesting right and so i i then followed him and and where where is this man going and he entered the kingdom of las posas and that's how i knew that's where we were going so it was very organic, right? It just unfolded yeah. on its own. Um, I didn't really know what he, what role he was going to play until he played it. I mean, that line just got to me. I was like, no. I mean, <laughs> well, I think it really made me reflect about, like, you know, growing up in the United States, but also growing up, like, you know, uh, growing up with being Mexican, right? And, it's how you view the devil, right? And right. These, these figures, right? Because we, I heart, I mean, the only time I hear about the devil is in a religious setting, right? But when yes. I hear of the diablo, I mean, we grew up, and it, it's it's weird to me for me to, even to say that, but to in the like my Latinx part or Mexican part, it's not even like the devil's that evil, right? To me, right. it's just, it's more of like he's a trickster. And exactly. It, yeah. And so right. to me, you made me like stop and be like, it. This, I was just like back, and so this line, I mean, I just, I, I had it. I was like, this is it. This is the winning line. <laughs> well, and I wanted to give him this this elusive personality, right? Where you don't see, is, is this person evil or is he just 
a, a trickster or what, you know, he isn't the dominant antagonist in the story. And that was by design, right? Precisely because the devil is a different character. Um, you know, it's, it's a diablo. And so yeah. you're, you're absolutely right to frame it in that way. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was beautiful to see even his character development and it really yeah. tied into like just both being, um, from the, you know, born in the United States and growing up Mexican. It just, that character really resonated with me in that, like, in a weird way, right? Like, I'm just going to resonate with the Diablo, right? Oh, my God, my, my mom sees this. She's going to be like, oh, Mika. Um, so, okay, so several of the places in your book are based on real places with historical significance. You mentioned a little bit of them before. Um, so how did you decide which places to include and what would you change or about or include about them in the story? Um, and what was your naming process for these locations? So with the exception of Ajean, which is the anagram for my family, the rest, that the, the names are what they're called. Oh, and Las Grutas de Oro, that, that doesn't exist. It's based on <laughs> the Grutas de Cacao Milpa. No, um, that was where we wanted to go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the rest were, I, I, I kid you not, I basically wrote what I did in Oaxaca City while I was there for my brother's wedding for that week. So we went to all of those places and I basically was like, it, 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 it was more like a guide, a walking tour of Oaxaca City, right? And then there's the Calenda and then there's the Arbol del Tule and all of these were just the places that I went to that were so vivid and still in my mind. Um, so it was very easy to, to just bring those into the story, very natural. That's amazing. And just like, that's how much of an impact these places had on yeah. you that you could mm -hmm. like describe them through your book. And so- um, Listen, Oaxaca City, I don't know if yeah. you've been there. I don't know if, you're, if your listeners have been there. It is so gorgeous. It is such a magical city and, and just a gastronomical center. The food, the food. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness, it was just, all we did was eat and eat and eat and eat and, eat and we danced and we did all sorts of other fun <laughs> stuff, but the food and the colors and you just walk down these streets and and, and the jacaranda trees and the music and it just all of it. I, I did not do justice to this city in the book. There was, it, it's such a rich and enchanting city. Um, so I'm very fortunate that I was able to borrow from that to build this <laughs> world because it was already just a magical world that I just kind of put into these pages. Yeah. That, yes, I've never been, but it's one of those. I mean, I think me Mexico in general is like a beautiful place and each region and each place has a different just beauty to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I definitely appreciate that in the book as someone who hasn't um, been able to visit certain places. I think it was wonderful to at least read read about them. Yeah, you really bring the pages to life in your or you know the locations to life in your in your your book. So you are so sweet. I I should I should call you on those days when I'm really struggling <laughs> to mean, figure out what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this, yeah, this book was really like I it in all honesty for all the individuals because I know it's not out yet. Mm. It was so different than all the other literature that I've read, and it just it included all like just different just the different parts that I think we grew up struggling with, right? Like being too American and being too Mexican and it just meshed them in perfectly into a game that we grew up playing, right? And so you did that and it reminded me a lot of just growing up, right? Yeah. And uh, and I just appreciated it a lot. So um, believe our words, cause we are like, yes. and I'm so excited for this book to come out. I mean, I just yeah. can't. It's it's um it's definitely a book I wish I had had when I was you know a middle grade reader, because um, even you know not just the loteria and and all of the other stuff, but the little things like seeing the papel picado or yeah. the food that um el chocolate the hot chocolate yeah. from the grandma and the <laughs> mom and all the, all of those little things really you know you kind of you see yourself in them and it really means a lot to to see yourself reflected in the work and to see that you know, just out there, so it really yeah. is beautiful, yeah. Like, I can't wait to to give it to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even like la, Las Plantitas, right? And la, like, the yeah. tia, who I, I, I don't know if you call her curandera in the book, right? We all have a tia, we all exactly. have like a curandera in our life, you know? Yep. And so yeah. these are things that are just nice reminders that it's okay to grow up in these, you know, and it's accepted and we're, you're connecting all of us. And I think, cause sometimes when it comes to certain things, you're just like, Oh, you know, it's hush, hush. 
but so you did that you brought them to light and i think yeah. it was it was beneficial and it was heartwarming and you did it in a beautiful way and this book was was just that um it was seamless all the cultural yes. details were embedded perfectly to where you know it's just it's just there <laughs> i don't know i don't know how better to describe it but like it just yeah it's it, it's just really beautifully done so it's it's exciting for us to like have people yes. get their hands on this book so but yes for uh, sure call us email us whenever you yes, want us to all the good it. stuff <laughs> uh Zelia, do you want to start uh the viewers chat i think we have two in the yeah. chat box so i know you answered you already let us know what your favorite loteria card but um someone did ask in the chat what your favorite dicho is from the the cards i'm oh, excited i'm gonna fail part. you here yeah. i'm gonna fail you here i don't i will i will post it on twitter because i okay. i don't recall i'd have to read them again okay. um yeah and then please translate it if it's it like i, I need you i want to know how you translate like those like ones where you're just like man this does not make <laughs> any sense <laughs> um and then there's another one um by uh, diana olivo posner and did you have to do a, lots of research on Loteria and do you use the library to do your research? Oh my gosh, so first of all, shout out to libraries. <laughs> I don't know how I would have survived this past year without our library. It just, and, and as an aside, so when I was living in Germany, we had very little access to books in English. When the first thing we did when we came back, we all got library cards. And when we found out that we could check out 125 books from our library, we did just that. And it was a glorious day. I absolutely loved it. So I'm um, so grateful to all of the libraries and librarians who have kept us alive and sane and going. Thank you. Um, I forgot the question. Oh, the research. <laughs> <laughs> so, happens to um, yeah, so I did. I did. I, again, to be to be authentic and honest in writing this, I really did have to do the work of researching these ideas. Fortunately, I did study philosophy in college and I have all of these boring books on philosophy. So I was able to pull from some of those resources. And of course, you know, the internet is a treasure trove of brilliant resources as well. Um, and, and there's a lot out there. And, and for any teachers and educators out there, this is a ripe topic for kids. There is so much out there. There are so many good arguments and good philosophers that have debated this over the years. It's fascinating. And, and again, there's no answer, which means that both sides are really <laughs> making good <laughs> arguments. Um, yeah. But yeah, the research was was really important, right? I couldn't just wing this. I had to I had to know what I was what I death <laughs> and life had to know what they were talking about. Exactly. And he balanced in the whole time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So what is it? You know, as we've mentioned a couple of times, the book is not yet out. But what is it like to promote an upcoming book right now, particularly with all the virtual and virtual visits and other limitations? And are you doing what kind of virtual visits are you doing or or what do you have coming up? So this is my debut novel and I don't know what I'm doing. I am so <laughs> grateful that I have this amazing team at Knopf behind me because they have been just oh, they've been so enthusiastic, so supportive really helping me bring this book out to the world. And then people like you reaching out and wanting to showcase it. Um, I think for, for me, the virtual experiences have been a godsend because it's made it very easy for me to reach people that I probably wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise, right? It's just really hard to travel to different locations and to be going and doing all these presentations live, but virtually you can connect with so many people. So I'm actually very grateful for the opportunities to do this virtually. Um, and then some exciting things that I have coming up is I was actually just invited by NPR's weekend edition to interview with them. So they will be talking to me and the interview will go live on September 5th. And I'm just so, I'm so delighted that they are interested in this and that they also want to share it with the world. Um, and yeah, it's just been really fun to connect with, with librarians, with educators, with schools. I have some visits coming up with different school districts. I have a couple of Kidlit festivals. So we have the Latinx Kidlit Festival coming up in December and I will be moderating a panel on middle grade characters. Some great uh, fellow Musas, I'm part of Las Musas Collective, and we have some really fantastic authors on that panel as well. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff coming up. The Boulder Children's Festival, I'll be at that. And 
um, some great uh, opportunities for, for people to hear about Loteria. That's exciting. And I think it, as the year rolls through, I think just uh, more promotion and just I, learning, hearing different people's takes on the book. Um, and I'm excited to hear you on NPR. Everyone put it on the <laughs> calendar. I know I will. I just, you know, I want to hear the different, what you talk about and how, you know, everyone else approaches the, bo approaches the book. Um, but rumor also has it that there's a teacher guide coming out. Am I correct? Well, there's a discussion guide at the end of the book. And yeah. I actually wrote that very specifically because as I wrote the book, I wanted to make sure there were questions that teachers could use to, to talk through the text. So for sure, <laughs> there's that. And then I also created that as a standalone document on my website. Uh, Knopf has created a really great uh, educational resource that includes a recipe for chocolate caliente. Oh, yeah. So if anybody's interested, that's <laughs> on there. Um, and they have some fun. They have a really fun crossword with with Spanish and English words, and the mm -hmm. translations of some of the dichos. And so there's there's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, I think it should be available within the next week or so. But at least the discussion guide is up and ready for anybody <laughs> who's interested. That's great. I think, and it's it's just cool guidance. And ya que viene el frío for the hot chocolate. I mean, we can yes. start a book club while drinking the hot chocolate. Well, and I'll tell you. So with this chocolate caliente, it's not it's not the one from the book because that's proprietary to Juana. Yes. And I was not able <laughs> to get it out of her. <laughs> but the recipe that I shared, it was funny because I, I I polled my family if they had a good chocolate caliente recipe. And my dad sent me a recipe that his mom, my abuelita Esperanza, had written beautiful handwriting on this little index card. And so I was like, this is such an unusual recipe. And it had condensed milk and butter and butter, butter and chocolate. Uh -huh. And he said, I remember being a little boy and my mother would make this and it was it was just like this this memory surfaced in his mind of of this chocolate caliente and so i thought this has to be it so that's that's the recipe that we included that's and actually i think it's actually a recipe for frosting if i'm honest <laughs> because my abuelita was a pastry chef and she would make these amazing cakes and so i think she would actually like mix milk in with like frosting and that was the hot chocolate but it's brilliant. It's it's just oh it's like that phenomenal hot chocolate recipe. Is, I Isn't can't that wait to wild? try it. So <laughs> right? Everyone has different different takes on like the in the chocolate. I mean, I make now I want to make it. And who doesn't like frosting, right? Right. I mean, that's my favorite part of the game. <laughs> okay, so we're almost closing. So before we leave, you want to play a quick game called this or that, or what we like to call rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just for fun and allows us to learn a little bit more about you. So I'll ask you something really fast, or we'll ask you something really fast, and you tell us which you prefer. All right. Okay. Ready? I'm, I'm going to start. <laughs> Tamales or playudas? Tamales. Norteñas or mariachi? Mariachi. Lucha libre or boxing? Lucha libre. <laughs> Dominos or viuda negra? Viuda negra. <laughs> chocolate de abuelita or chocolate Ibarra? Abuelita. All the time, <laughs> every day. <laughs> Café de olla or té? Café de olla. Katrina or life? Oof. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> and she's like, no, no. All right, we'll let you, we'll let you. Okay, favorite mood booster song? Oh, you know what? I, I I have to apologize because I don't listen to music other than my my family. They're all musicians. My husband plays the piano. My son plays the piano. My daughter plays the piano. So I don't listen to anything other than them playing the piano. So, so they're whatever music. they're playing is what, what's going on in my background. No, that's so sweet. Oh, okay. Uh, pan dulce or polvorones? Pan dulce. Pan dulce. France or Germany? France. Chicago or Mexico City? <gasps> oh. um, well, I have to say Chicago because I'm here now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right, last one. Salsa, salsa verde or salsa roja? <laughs> you know what? I'm going to throw a twist in there. Salsa de cacahuate. <gasps> oh. That's really that, Man, that's really yeah. Now I want some tacos, y'all. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> This whole last part just made me hungry. Some polvorones with some. I know. <laughs> some uh, chocolate abuelita. I think I have some. Yeah. <laughs> I gave so I gave my son for Christmas three of the things of chocolate abuelita, and that was his gift from me. 
and he still has one left over. He has been, it's like gold for him. Yeah, and, yes. And, you know, it is. And sometimes he'll share it and sometimes he won't. And it's just <laughs> such a special treat for him, that chocolate abuelita. Oh, I mean, okay. coming from mom, yes. I, I know, mean, right? I, anytime my mom, I'm like, I'm, I'm not sharing. <laughs> Same here. Um, all right, well, so that's the end of our game. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Penny, I love the book. We can't wait for everyone else to read it. Um, it's been such a joy to talk to you, and we're looking forward to hearing you on NPR and then seeing you at the Latinx Kid Lit Festival. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this conversation with author with our author, Carla Valenti. And remember to visit lapl.org to read more books by Carla. We hope that you will all also mark your calendars to join us virtually on Saturday, September 25th for the Los Angeles Libros Festival. This is a free bilingual book festival for the whole family. And it is a collaboration between the Los Angeles Public Library, La Libreria, and Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos and the Spanish speaking. To learn more about the festival, please visit at the link that's gonna pop up in the chat <laughs> and down here on the screen. Um, and remember that our next Your Author program will be next Friday with Patty and me again on August 27th at 4 p.m. Join us as we chat with author and teacher Ernesto Cisnero as he presents his award-winning book, Efren Divided. So thank you all so much for joining us and attending our virtual Your Author program. We can't wait to see you all next week as we discuss another excellent book. Um, thank you. Adios. Hasta luego. Bye. Have a good one.